about now? No. Is it working? Good. How about now? Yes. Good. Great. Well, good evening. I'd like to extend to all of you a very warm welcome to the New York Society Library and to our program this evening, which is a conversation about betrayal, friendship, and family in fiction. We have with us two experienced novelists, Beth Gushin and Lauren Belfer. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to remind you all to turn off your cell phones if you've not already done so. And tonight's event, like all our events, will be recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. So if you'd like to go down for posterity, I'll be sure and ask a question during the question and answer period. <laughs> and I'd like to mention there will be books for sale just outside this room after the program. And that the Mar have kindly agreed to sign copies here in this room afterwards. Um, one announcement for our members. I've, I'm very excited to announce the launch next Monday, March 4th, of the brand new renovated New York Society Library website. It will streamline your use of the library. And it's got so many wonderful new creative options developed over the course of the last year that if any of you here are not subscribed to the library, I hope when you see it, you will do so promptly. <laughs> I'd like also to mention something before I introduce our speakers. This is Beth's latest book. It's technically not published until Saturday, but we've got copies outside. Anyway, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Beth Gutchen and Lauren Belfort, who are, as it happens, good friends as well as colleagues. Beth has been the author of nine novels, and her screenplay for the documentary The Children of Theater Street, which you may remember from 1978, was nominated for an Academy Award. Gossip, her latest novel, examines the emotions of three closely linked, but temperamentally very different women. Like Gossip, much of Lauren's latest novel, A Fierce Radiance, takes place right here on the Upper East Side. Lauren has created a distinguished career for herself in historical fiction. Her first novel, A City of Light, was a New York Times notable book of the year. And her latest novel, which some of you will have read, A Fierce Radiance, is a Washington Post best novel of the year and a National Public Radio best mystery of the year. She uses a very broad canvas and a meticulous historical research to paint a picture of the lives of those who developed penicillin during World War II. And in addition, the Fierce Radiance comprises a love story, a murder mystery, and a spy thriller all in one volume. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you in this room will have enjoyed, as I did, revisiting New York in the 19. Well, I won't say I was here in the 40s, but in, in the 50s and the 60s, all the way to the present day. And one of the great joys of reading these books for me was to revisit the places, the streets and the corners, that some of which are no longer with us. And I think the atmosphere of both these books is something that will stay with me for a long time. So, Lauren, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? And Beth, is your mic working? No, I do. First, um, thank you so much, Carol, for that lovely introduction. And I want to thank the staff at the library, particularly Mark Bartlett, the librarian, and Sarah Elliott Holliday, who made all the arrangements for this event tonight. And I also want to thank all the other wonderful people who greeted us as we came in. I know there are a lot of staff people here tonight. Um, it's a real honor and privilege to speak here at the New York Society Library. I did most of the research for both my novels right here. Uh, and I, I think it speaks to the 
breadth of the collection here that there's more historical material here about Buffalo than there is in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> that also speaks to the power of Buffalo, I think, in 1901, uh, that so much information wound up here. Um, at any rate, tonight we're going to talk about a very difficult and serious subject, betrayal in fiction. Um, first, I want to say I was very surprised um, when I s started reading Beth's new book, Gossip, to learn what the word gossip actually means, which is far from what we think of um, when we toss that word around. So Beth, could you tell us how you came to the title and what it actually means? Well, I learned this from my husband, who's a better friend than I am, especially if we're talking dictionaries. He <laughs> <laughs> explained um, that gossip is actually short for God sibling. For a thousand years, the, the, first, the OED first uh, uh, notices it in the 10th or 11th century. It's a, a gossip is, gossips are uh, God siblings of the same child or the parents of a child and that child's godparents. And so gossip, the talk, means to talk about someone in whom you have a genuine and constructive and loving interest. And it wasn't until, Shakespeare's the first person to use it as a verb, mm -hmm. but he used it in the sense of, with all my heart I will hide me, hide me to this gossipy wedding, meaning it will be intimate and familial and I can't wait to get there. Dickens also used it that way. It's really uh, quite recent that gossip has come to mean, well, the whole spectrum from its original meaning to the very, uh, the sometimes nasty commercial use that is made of it. Do you think that men and women gossip differently? This is a question I got every time I went out to talk about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, the answer is yes, I do. I think that women um, talk about absent others more because they're more interested in the subject. But I will say that the meanest gossips I've ever known have all been men. <laughs> so, um, but, but that leads me to something I want to say that's a little that's that's more serious, which is uh, it, it starts this way. Last winter. We went to one of the pen author evenings for Billy Collins, as it happens. The poet laureate, you probably know, he's a very funny writer. But before he became a poet, he was a teacher, which means he really knows. He has to think about it because he has to explain why he writes what he does, why he doesn't write what he doesn't, what he's interested in reading. And in the question and answer period, someone said to him, have you ever thought of writing a novel? And he said, no. I'm not very interested in personality. <laughs> I was stunned. I had never heard a human being say such a thing. I didn't know it was possible. <laughs> that led me to uh, something that I think really is important, which is um, there is an evolutionary reason why women would be more interested in personality than men in a, in a, a sexually dimorphic hunter-gatherer troop. You, would, you, you didn't need any generalists. You, the people specialized. The ones who were big had to be strong, and they had to be fast, and they had to be aggressive so that they could kill, so that the troop could eat. And the ones who had breasts and wounds had to understand how the individuals in the troop related to each other and to the troop as a whole, or else accidents of personality could blow the thing up, and without the troop, the individuals didn't survive. So. It's not surprising that many men prefer to read no fiction at all or fiction with no recognizable human psychology and things that blow up. <laughs> it's just that the poor babies are not as evolved as all of them. <laughs> but you and I have talked about this whole kind of ghettoization of kinds of fiction. Well, and I... Um... I don't like the idea of genre in fiction, of people getting categorized and put into little boxes. And I often think of this um, in regard to my first novel, City of Light, which some of you know takes place in Buffalo in 1901. It's about a strong woman facing down uh, the powers 
of the city of Buffalo, which was one of the centers of America at that time. Um, you know, I wrote that entire book, all 750 pages, before I thought I would show it to an agent, um, in part because I was very afraid. You know, I was an unknown writer, and how do you show a 750-page book about Buffalo to someone <laughs> midstream? Um, but when I finished and felt that I, the time had come to get another look at it, um, a very close friend of mine knew someone who was an agent and arranged for me to send that. And it's very important nowadays that you have an entree to an agent because very few of them read the slush pile. Um, and that agent called me about a month later and said that she couldn't take my book because it didn't fit into any genre. And that because I was a close friend of a close friend of hers, she said she had gone through it to show me the kind of surgery that she needed, that the book needed. She proceeded to tell me that if I wanted to make it a mystery, I had to change it in all these ways. If I wanted to make it a woman's novel, I had to change it in all these ways. A thriller, it had to be changed in such and such, you know, and then even a coming of age story, this was what I had to do to it. And, you know, and the final thing she said was that you had to write a book knowing where Barnes & Noble was going to put it on the shelf. And, uh, you know, I was devastated by this. And, um, but luckily I called a friend, um, a close friend, who said, you know, forget all that, don't do anything. Just send it to the next person on your list. Which I did, and that person accepted it, and is my wonderful agent to this day. But it does show how, you know, as a writer, you have to be sort of true to your own path and not fall, that the book has to be true to itself. It's an organic, living thing. And you can't, you know, conduct surgery on it to make it more of one thing or another. I think people, when they, they, want, it, they want to make fiction, which is a complicated human endeavor, simpler than it is. And um, Lauren is too modest to tell you that the book that needed so much surgery was a Barnes & Noble Discover, one of the three finalists for their Discover Prize for the best new novels of the year. You know, I thank you, Beth, but um, I, I think that all novels, even, you know, the mystery novels, even Chicklet, what, any novel that, that rivets the reader is going to touch on so many parts of life, and I dare say even Lee Child novels and all these so-called you know, novels for men where things blow up. And so, <laughs> you know, very sensitive men I know love those books, and so I know that um, they're offering a truth about life as well, and I think that's how we have to look at, at fiction as a whole, not as individual compartments. Um, now, one thing, I'd like to talk about turning to our books. Um, there's a scene in Gossip that takes place at a fictional women's club that Beth calls the Town Club. And many readers have mentioned that scene to me as something they found absolutely arresting, and a scene that lived with them for a long time. And I wonder if, um, Beth, you could read that, and then I will tell you all what people found so hard about that scene, and could find out what Beth's thoughts were as she conjured it up. This is a scene in which the narrator of gossip, whose name is uh, Lovey, she, uh, she's, a, she's a single woman, she runs a dress shop on the Upper East Side. Um, she's well-born and well-educated, but has no money, um, or relatively little money. And she <coughs> makes her living working with people who have a lot more than she has in uh, worldly resources. She belongs to the colony. And in this scene, she's been invited by an older friend of hers whom she adores to an event at the town club. The older friend is called Belinda. Um, I think Belinda had put together a table for this particular program more than anything else to please me. 
as the speaker was an author I revered. Having a half hour gap between a medical appointment near the club and the time of the luncheon, I threw myself on the mercy of the door staff who know me well. They allowed me to wait for Belinda upstairs where I could find a quiet corner to read my book instead of sitting in the little holding pen by the door where non-members are normally sequestered. <laughs> I chose a tall wing chair next to a window with my back to most of the room, thinking to be most private there. Instead, I found myself in earshot of a conversation that was certainly none of my business and was, besides, destructive of concentration. Two ladies I didn't know, who had apparently come from a club meeting of some sort, were discussing candidates for membership. Rising to change seats seemed wrong at that point, as the talk was sufficiently indiscreet that we would all have been embarrassed. So I did my best instead to pay attention to the words on the page. I lost the battle, though, when I heard Dinah's name. Dinah is one of her best friends since high school. Her proposer is a great friend of mine. Believe me, I'm damned if I do and damned if I don't. Well, you have to tell me more than that. The committee can't just table a nomination without a reason. Well, we can't say why in open meeting. Why not? Because it's hearsay. I can't prove anything. Well, then tell me, and if I take your point, I'll vote with the rest of you, and you'll have a majority, no discussion needed. There was a silence. You have to swear you won't tell. You can't ever say you heard it from me. All right. Were you in New York when she was writing that column, Dynamite? I love that column. Yes, but remember how suddenly it disappeared? A pause. Did it? Overnight. Yanked out of the paper by the roots. All right. And? Now wait, she was going on maternity leave. My friend Elise knows her pretty well. Elise adores her. She was caught extorting money from people in exchange for keeping their secrets out of the paper. Blackmail? Another pause. Finally, the shocked second speaker added, God, that's ugly. But you see the point. If even here you had to worry that something you say is going to wind up in the paper or that she'd come asking to be paid not to, yes, but wait, why isn't she in jail? She made a deal. She's very well connected. God, yes. Now the only thing wrong with that scene is that every word that was re retailed about Dinah is false. In fact, diametrically false. She did the opposite of what she was just accused of. So the readers um, who have spoken to me, some have said, that Bobby should have gotten up at that moment and protested to the two women that none of this was true, that they had the completely incorrect story. And other readers have said to me, I've been in that same situation so many times and there's nothing you can do. And it seems to me that Beth has captured one of the truths of our lives, something we've all experienced and tortured ourselves about how do we come to the defense of a friend? Um, how far can we go without harming ourselves? When is it appropriate to intervene? And I wonder, Beth, for the people who've said to me <coughs> that Lovey should have gotten up and made a protest, what, what you think of that, what your reaction is? I, 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 know, um, I know this question. I had a woman uh, in a book club for whom I did an evening who just laid into me. There are three uh, moments in the novel where Lovey knows things about Dinah's life that she doesn't tell Dinah. And this woman, alone among her group, I will say, um, said, I, I just didn't understand it at all. I just stood right up. I just told her right then. And um, the point for me is that, uh, yes, she might have. I might have. I don't think I would have in this case, but. Lovey couldn't. Lovey is a woman who depends upon being a sort of blank slate. For one thing, she has a secret. She 
um, she's having an affair with a much older but very married man. <laughs> and he is the love of her life. There's as much one could say about this, but in any case, that is a true thing. And she can't afford to have people wheeling around saying, well, who are you? Who are you to talk? So that's thing one. <coughs> what I was thinking of more in this scene is that a club is an extension of your home. She was a guest there of an older lady who would not have understood if she'd made some kind of scene. She was in a part of the club where she should not have been. And she was eavesdropping. I, I didn't see how she could act without betraying the bonds of hospitality and friendship that she owed to her hostess. The issues of, of secrets and how secrets relate to betrayal is something that we'll be talking about more tonight. Um, and I'm going to read a scene from my first novel, City of Light, um, as Beth and I talked about this program, we realized that um, gossip and City of Light deal with many of the same issues. Um, so, as I said before, for those of you who don't know, City of Light takes place in 1901 in Buffalo, when Buffalo is one of the centers of America. And um, the main character is the headmistress of a girls' school there, and she's uh, built her career in such a way that she has become a powerful figure in the community. And her secret is that years ago, she had a one night stand with Grover Cleveland, who was from Buffalo, and went on to become president, or actually was and, and a president. famous, famous woman. Famous woman. And she bore a child, and the child was adopted by her best friend. And that's her secret. That's your secret, and I, I asked uh, Lauren to read from this scene because there's a fascinating tension in the novel. Uh, Louisa has a secret, but she is also the moral center of the book. And Mary Talbot, Talbot who is uh, a real character, was a very aristocratic African-American uh, crusader for social justice who asks Louisa to um, stand with her in, uh, in a particular setting. And suddenly, Louisa's moral path becomes very complicated because of her secret. Um, yes, so in this scene, um, they've been at a meeting at the Buffalo Club, um, a bastion of masculinity in those days. And the meeting has to do with the, the arrangements for the Pan American Exposition, which will soon open in Buffalo. And Mary Talbert is a bit of a firebrand at that. You know, she's one of the first uh, crusaders for civil rights. Uh, she has made a protest to the organizing committee, requesting, demanding, really, that there should be an exhibit at the exposition on the achievements of African Americans. There's going to be an exhibit on plantation life. And Negroes have been brought up will be brought up from the South to play the slaves in this plantation scene. That there's no recognition of the, the great achievements of African Americans. Um, and Mary Talbert, as Beth said, makes this protest and expects that Louisa Barrett will stand with her, and Louisa cannot stand with her. And this the scene begins right after the confrontation with the committee. Mary Talbert strode far ahead of me down the path beneath the spreading elms, as if we hadn't come to the meeting together. Her carriage waited outside the gate. When he saw her, the driver, an elderly, fastidious Negro, got down and opened the door. Motioning him back to his position, she turned to me, standing beside the carriage and waiting for me to catch up. Under her pressing gaze, I felt that I'd been transformed into her enemy. Why didn't you second my opinion, she asked. Why didn't you help me in there? There was no point to it. Nothing would have been gained. I would have been speaking out of turn. Speaking out of turn, Louisa? How many battles have been lost by people reluctant to speak out of turn? My position is not a pulpit, and I hold my position at the sufferance of those men in there. 
If I lose my position, I have nothing. Before you condemn me, please remember that you have no position to lose. You live to fight another day from the resources of your husband's home. You travel from battle to battle in your private carriage with your driver at your command. As you would urge me to battle, so I would urge you to mercy. Your job as headmistress is so precious that you will not risk it. What's the worst that could happen to you? If you were dismissed here, you would find other cities to snap you up. We in Buffalo may think ourselves at the center of the world, but we are not. It's not arrogant provincialism that keeps me here, Mary. I'm committed to my girls. They too would lose if I lost. There are schools for girls in many cities, and at Macaulay, someone would be found to replace you. I cannot go to another city. This is the city where I must remain. She continued to gaze at me intently, and I fought the urge to look away. So, something personal holds you back. Woe to us all when we let the personal hold sway over the fight for justice. With that bit of self-righteousness, she departed. I stood at the gates of the Buffalo Club and watched her carriage drive along Delaware Avenue toward downtown until it merged with all the others and I could find it no more. Something personal, yes. Later that afternoon, I stood at the balustrade on the second floor of the Macaulay School, and I watched the girls coming and going from their classes. They were a gently chattering stream of bows and ribbons, high button shoes, leather bound notebooks. Soon I would see her, the one I waited for, my heart skipping a beat at the flash of her spot smile. But at school, I would make no special signal to her, enough that I should come upon her by chance in the library, or that I might look out at the flagstone courtyard and see her reading on the bench beside the fountain. She was everywhere, filling the school I had made for her. Here I was safe, and here I could make her safe my daughter. You have no idea how hard it is to create a sort of Chinese box like this. Louisa is a truly moral character and she cannot act. She's just, Lauren's just got her shut up. I just love it. So. <laughs> um, as we continue the talk about secrets, I mean, Beth's character, Lovey, also is completely boxed in by the secret that she is struggling so hard to keep. And she plans, lives decades of her life around this wonderful man who is the love of his, her life and lives apart from his wife for most of the year. Um, they rarely appear in public together and yet they have a very fulfilling life together. And Lovey expects that after this man, Gil, dies, that he will leave to her the house in Connecticut that they've shared, where they've lived together on the weekends. And now we, Beth will read the section where we learn what actually happens. <laughs> I just want to say about Lovey that when I, I first thought of her, uh, I thought of her as Nick Carraway. She was going to be a, 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 an, a, a trustworthy narrator who would observe all the action but not make anything happen. Mm -hmm. But then I discovered, once I was well launched, that there's a difference between a book like Gatsby that takes place in a very limited time period and one that takes place over 30 years, I was really gonna have to explain why this woman's life was so quiet and mostly invisible. And that's when she fell in love with Gil, who was um, old enough to be her father, but uh, just a wonderful man. And uh, he's the father of three daughters, one of whom at least uh, knows all about Lovey. Um, sorry, I didn't make a 
and Dr. Ferrer is going to spot there, I'll start here. Um, I suppose I'd better admit here that I was dealing with something almost more disorienting than Gil's death, which after all we had both always known was coming. It was this. As you will have gathered, there was a place in Connecticut that had been ours, his and mine. It had come to him from his parents. Althea had never been interested. It was a small house of great charm, the place where we lived together as a couple. There were gardens, especially a rose garden, planted and tended by me for many years. Huge deciduous trees like peaceful giants surrounded us with colors in the fall. He'd always told me it would come to me, along with enough money to keep it. I can't explain it. It's not that I can't get along without a country house. It's the surprise. Well, the shock. My gardens. How many times had he seen me come in glowing after an afternoon of staking delphiniums, deadheading peonies and digging in the rose beds, knowing I thought they would always be mine? I'll never know what changed, or if this was always his plan, nor will I ever be the same. I found out at the funeral through an innocent conversation with the Flood's estate lawyer whom I had met earlier that morning. The service was at the church of St. Vincent Ferrer, Althea's church, in the East Sixties, right down Lexington Avenue from Hunter College. It's a neighborhood I know well, not far from my first flat, where I lived when I worked for Philomena. The day was bright and dry, if still very raw, but I had dressed for a walk after the service. The reception was to be held at Gil and Althea's apartment, and of course, I couldn't go there. Instead, I stood, stood in the narthex, waiting for Althea and the children to enter the small herd of limousines that idled outside and be whisked off, watching the friends and extended family pouring past me as if I were a rock in a stream bed and they were the water. As they descended the church steps in the pale sunlight, they were already beginning to chatter to each other about the beauty of the service and whether to walk or to look for a taxi when the lawyer joined me. He was just doing his version of mourning Gil by musing aloud what a wise and thoughtful job Gil had done of planning for his loved ones, unlike some of his clients who seemed truly to believe they were taking it with them. <laughs> How carefully Gil had weighed this against that, um, against that, so that all three children could share equally in unequal things. He felt free to talk to me of such matters, as he knew I'd been close enough to Gil to be a legatee. He mentioned that Gil had left me a token sum of money and his grandfather's gold pocket watch, which he'd been given on his own 21st birthday. Gil carried it when he wore black tie, which he rarely did with me. He had left my house to his daughters. The lawyer had no idea that he had just reached down my throat and stopped my heart. Uh, I've, that scene is devastating, I think. And I've read Gossip three times <coughs> now, and each time I have to stop there, close the book, because that scene is so powerful that I, I just can't go on anymore. And, and everything we've seen of Gil uh, portrays him as a wonderful man. He's a wonderful man. So Beth, I ask you, how could he have done this to her? <laughs> well, um, I used to think about Scott Fitzgerald who wrote in the crack up that the test of the first class mind is to hold two unreconcilable ideas at one time and retain the ability to function. But lately it's occurred to me that he was having a crack up. <laughs> I'm not sure that's right. Another writer whom I uh, greatly admire, that would be my colleague, um, wrote in A Fierce Radiance of Claire, who has the uh, heroine who has been terribly betrayed by her father, who loves her. And she says, the two impulses to warn him, to denounce him, left her paralyzed. I think Gil was paralyzed. I think he understood that he was in a situation that he shouldn't be in, which was that he was having a long time affair with a woman who was not his wife, and that he loved her, 
happy, and that he just hoped it would go away. That, you know, that he wouldn't have to finally decide. <coughs> and so he was paralyzed, and he just waited, he didn't punch. And I wonder, too, if he, he was caught between the two betrayals, that if he left Lovey the house, then his daughters would feel exactly. betrayed. And they already and felt betrayed. Yeah. Do you think there was any way that he might not have seen it as a betrayal? Because I think the wonderful thing about fiction is that we can see things from every side of the prism. We can put ourselves in other people's shoes, and because Gil is so sympathetic, it's hard as a reader, and maybe this is why the scene is so devastating and the great job you've done in creating his character. You just can't believe it. You can't see cruelty in him. I, uh, um, it's, I think he knows he was betraying her, but I think he is a man, and isn't terribly good at imagining other people's realities. He's interested in many noble things, but personality isn't one of them. I don't think he has any idea of what he's doing to her. And he doesn't, for obvious reasons, want to. But that made me think of your character, that wonderful scene with Louisa and her patron in Buffalo, where she makes the terrible discovery about how she happened to be in that hotel room with Grover Cleveland in the first place. Another case of a powerful man who thought he was acting for the greater good and just missed something. Right. Um, so I'll read this section. Um, this is toward the end of the novel, when Louisa Barrett really is forced to confront the truth of her life, and her daughter is now nine or ten. She realizes, as Beth says, what happened to her. And um, <coughs> this is a section of the novel uh, when President Ben um, McKinley is in Buffalo to, to honor the Pan American Exposition, and they're having a great reception for him at the Rumsey Estate, it's called. And now this it was an actual place in Buffalo. Uh, the Rumseys were the most important family in Buffalo in 1901. And to imagine their estate, you have to think of Downton Abbey, literally, <laughs> but downtown. So surrounded by um, the beautiful skyscraper architecture that was going up in Buffalo then. So when you think of what the city, you know, city so downtrodden now must have been like in its glory days, it's really always astonishing to me. There's an old growth forest uh, as part of the estate, and Louisa and her patron Dexter Rumsey have left the reception for McKinley and gone off um, to walk quietly in the woods. Um, you also need to know that there's been a great deal of pressure um, and upset in the community and threats uh, have been exchanged because of the power station and questions of who is going to control uh, the power being developed at, at uh, Niagara Falls. And, uh, JP Morgan has been involved in developing uh, the hydroelectric power station and there's been a recent bombing by environmentalists protesting the development of hydroelectric power. So a lot of pressure has been brought to bear. There's a lot of tension in the city. And Louisa's daughter was adopted into the family of one of the men who's running the power station. And, Elizabeth, and she's become, Louisa's become fearful for her daughter's safety and has actually gone to see <coughs> Grover Cleveland to see if he will try to protect their daughter together. And now, she, as I say, she's walking in the forest with Dexter Rumsey after having gone to see Grover Cleveland. In their way, the woods of Rumsey Park were as manicured as the formal gardens. Every woodland tree planted, every bubbling cascade shaped with the overall effect in mind. I had walked here many times over the years, and I welcomed every opportunity. 
From the moment I followed the path into the woods, trees sheltered me and silence enveloped me. These woods were famous in the city and laden with romantic mystery. In their midst was a serpentine lake where generations of children had learned to ice skate and to row boats, including F. Scott Fitzgerald, by the way. <laughs> a spired Gothic gazebo graced the lake shore. Near the center of the lake was a small island with a Grecian peristyle just large enough to shelter a boating party from the rain. Today, because of a passing noontime shower, the woods were moist and shimmery, fragrant with the scents of late summer. I've been so upset, Mr. Rumsey. I haven't known what to do or where to turn. I even went to see President Cleveland to ask him. I gasped that I had said Cleveland's name aloud at last. Mr. Rumsey asked, did he remember you? And at that moment, like a mist, slowly lifting to reveal the world in exquisite clarity, all became evident to me. I saw everything afresh, with true meanings revealed. The suspicious lack of suspicion all these years, the school's board's acquiescence to my every desire. They had known. They had even arranged. We stared at one another, Dexter Rumsey and I. I felt tears pooling in my eyes. Don't judge us harshly, my dear, he said. We needed to do what was best for the city, not for ourselves. For the city, I repeated. Yes, we trusted he'd be reelected president in 92. We wanted him on our side, on the city's side. A sympathetic ear in the White House can be helpful, do you understand? I shook my head no, though comprehension unfurled before me. You see, my dear, we knew he'd be looking for someone. That it was his nature, always to want someone. Why not guide him, we thought, to someone we could trust, for his own protection? so he wouldn't embarrass himself or us. You were perfect in every way. I asked Miss Love to invite you to her reception. I pointed you out to him. I said he would enjoy your conversation. That was all I said, but he understood me, and he was pleased. Oh, yes, more than pleased. Rumsey chuckled bleakly at the recollection. I knew he would be pleased. How could he not be pleased with you? So beautiful and well-educated, so amusing with your dry wit that I've always found so appealing. And you seem to understand the necessity too. I understood nothing. I was innocent. For a moment he pondered this. Ah, so you went to the sacrifice unknowing. There's something reminiscent of Greek tragedy about that, isn't there? <coughs> but at any rate, none of us has, has ever forgotten what you did. We've always shown our gratitude, haven't we? What could I say? For years, I'd blamed myself. I'd struggled to reconcile myself to what had happened, to find a way to maintain control over my life. And now he told me that I hadn't been in control at all. With concern, he pressed. Haven't you been happy at how we've treated you all these years? Is there anything else we could have done that we didn't do? We've tried to see to it that you never suffered. Please reassure me on that. Even I doubt myself when I turn off the light at night. I could see from his face that he did doubt, that he did care. How strange that he could simultaneously use me as a pawn and fret over my well-being. But I bore a child, Mr. Rumsey. Yes, my dear, but I'm the only one who knows that for certain, and I shall never betray you. For the first time in my life, I wanted to hurt someone, to hurt him, to watch him suffer the anguish I had suffered. I stared at his kindly face. And in that moment, I realized I wouldn't lift a hand against him. 
I still have to protect Graves. Come now, my dear, dry your eyes. Your daughter is well cared for. All has worked out for the best, has it not? We've grown, we've prospered. The city, I mean, beyond our wildest dreams. We've all been very lucky. Come, let us walk. Putting his arm around me, he led me along the path. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that when I began writing City of Light, I didn't know that the men of the city had set Louisa up with Grover Cleveland. You know, this uh, book has a first-person narrator, and as I wrote the book, I felt I was walking with <coughs> Louisa on her journey, that we were together as, as I wrote this. And when I got to this section, very close to the end, um, it was as if there I was, walking with Louisa in the forest. And then Dexter Rumsey said, oh, you, did Grover Cleveland remember you? And I was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, as the writer, then I stopped and said to myself, what is he saying? <laughs> <laughs> and then like Louisa, I realized that that was the truth of the story. Um, and I had to write the scene that way and, and hear what he had to say. Um, and when I looked back at the scene the next day, I, again, I thought, yes, you know, I never planned for this, but this is what happened. Um, and I went back through the book and added a few things here and there, and I didn't have to add much. But you know, it's a, a kind of rule among fiction writers that you can't hit the reader with something completely from left field. You can't have a deus ex machina you know, in, in serious fiction that, that you expect to be a sincere recreation of the world and a recreation of life. You can't just hit people with things that come out of nowhere. So I put tiny clues throughout so that when the reader got to that point, the reader would be shocked, but would also say, as Louisa said, yes, I see. Yes, that's, that's what happened. The, the thing I thought was so brilliant is that history completely supports it. What do we know about Grover Cleveland? Ma, Ma, where's my father gone? The White House, ha, ha, ha. He, he did that. <laughs> and the and Buffalo couldn't that. afford another scandal of the same kind. And, you know, when I look at Dexter Romsey, um, and, you know, he still has family in Buffalo. His gra grandchildren and great grandchildren are there, and they often ask me when I go to Buffalo. You know, how could you portray our great-grandfather that way? Um, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I also see the story so clearly through his eyes that I think a lot with him about this question of the relativity of betrayal. He didn't think, and he never thought that he was betraying her. He, thought that she understood the priorities of the city. He thought what he was doing was for the greater good of the city. Um, and, the, and that she would see it the way he saw it. That she would see it that way. But, but what he was forgetting was that she, it was sort of like, it, that she was a moral being. And he took away from her the right to make a choice that was a moral choice and that, had, that put her in a terrible trap for the rest of her life. And he never saw really what he'd done. He never saw it and sometimes I wonder if Gil and Mr. Romsey have a lot in common. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were both certainly men of their time. <laughs> Thank God we live in such a more enlightened age. <laughs> Well, and you know what happens that it's two powerful men we're talking about here, but I, I think the issue is not gender, the issue is power. 
and and that's exactly right. And the power that people have over one another, whether it's friends betraying one another, um, or lovers of whatever sex um, betraying one another, people manipulating one another for their own ends and justifying it by saying that, that their ends are the most important. You know, that the other person must see it that way. That the other person has a, has a proper um, view of the world. And in that sense, we really do lose track of the moral empathy that we should have for other people. Laura and I have been having this conversation for about three years. <laughs> so before we go on for another three, um, do any of you have questions? Yes, I, I don't think that it's necessarily a characteristic of the past. I think that when a man is having an affair, and he's very, very much a product of his manners and his, and his upbringing, and he wasn't with loving all the time, that something might have happened between the, his promise and his legacy that suddenly made him feel very guilty. He felt, listen, I gave her all these years. I gave her all this happiness. What's going to happen when my children find out? I can't do this to them. And I gave her enough. Surely she loved me enough to understand. And what I'm saying is, what <coughs> lovers cannot always <coughs> accept is the rationality of people's minds and feelings beyond the words they use. That's very well observed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to me, there's secrecy becomes an aphrodisiac. Yeah. Ooh, did you hear that? He said yeah, secrecy yeah. becomes an aphrodisiac. Yeah. <laughs> so so he never intended to leave her the house. Oh. Mm -hmm. Is that? Um, I just wanted to say, because I discussed this several times with this kid, or a very prominent kid, and he said to me how many people um, really write wills for their wife when they read the lives, the lives are shocked, they do these things. So there's anger, but what I feel is to your mom, because you sat down and explained to her, you know, the the shocking the, um, uh, she said she's an estates lawyer did I hear you right and and had has often seen it happen that a husband has written a will that he thinks his wife is going to understand perfectly and instead she's shocked no no he wants he has cut the wife out. He has cut the wife he out. He has anger, but he can say he oh. has anger. He, he doesn't break the... Yeah, yeah, he doesn't express his anger. He just waits for her. Yeah. If Gil had left a letter to her with the lawyer to open at the, after he died, yes. he yeah. would have redeemed himself. Yeah, he would explain himself. Sure, and maybe made her understand. That's no, I, I, I think it's a male and a female thing, definitely. As a male, uh, thinking about uh, a will and, and closer and further away <laughs> from an ending, um, you think about your, your children, your family, and you really don't want to leave anything that is going to be a stigma on your family. So that in his head, I believe, he was doing what was right for him and for his family. Um, and I think this side thing that he had going, um, well, it fell into a different category. But what was important <coughs> was his name, and he had children that uh, bore his name. And that was the important thing. I, I agree with that entirely. Could you, could you all hear that? Mm -hmm. um, I was, as Lauren <laughs> said about Dexter Rumsey, 
Um, when uh, Lovey began this relationship, I was shocked. I didn't think she was that kind of girl. <laughs> and, um, I felt that I didn't, I also didn't know until we got close to the end that Gil was going to leave the house away from her. But what I did know was that they, are, they were both good people doing something that they knew was not a good thing, and that sooner or later mm -hmm. the trap was going to spring on them, and that they both understood that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm wondering if I'm missing something here. Louisa and her situation, just say no? Was it an yeah. option? Was this a relationship? This was a one night oh, stand. Oh, uh, yes. asking about the relationship with Grover Cleveland. Um, it was just a one night stand, and she was entrapped yeah. into being with him. She could not say no. She could not escape. the The yeah. rulers of the city set this up in such a way that if she had tried to escape, she would have been thoroughly condemned. Whereas if she stayed and did what was expected of her, it would be kept secret, I, as it was. The way I read that scene when she's with <coughs> Grover Cleveland is that by the time she understood what she was doing in that room, it, it was a question mm -hmm. of physical power. She couldn't have gotten away. It, it just would was have been a worse rape or whatever we would call it. And she was an innocent. She didn't know the clues or the signals. She just. She didn't know. You know, so many things we take for granted nowadays. Women were kept so sheltered in those days. You know, well brought up women like Louisa. Um, they would go to their wedding nights not knowing what was going to happen to them. And unfortunately, she had no understanding. And, and then once she understood, it was too late. Uh, yes. Uh, you've done a wonderful job, clearly, because everyone in the room believes that both of these stories are true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a question of craft, though, just to turn, uh, turn it away for a minute, and then we go back to talking about Gil again. <laughs> uh, it, it seems to me that novels portray people as bags of secrets. Uh, one secret, two secrets, and however many you need to make the whole novel go at the top level of primary characters. But when you're imagining a novel, how far down the character list do you go to knowing what the secret is going to be? The, the, the primary couple, of three, four, all of them? You know, <laughs> uh, does, you know, does Mr. I forget his name, the man who owns Buffalo? Oh, does Mr. Rums. Does, does he have a secret too? I mean, he's got a secret, but he sent this book a lot. But does he have other secrets? And, and do you know them even though they didn't, they didn't come out of the book? I, I, that's right. Right. Yeah. All right. Mr. Rumsey has many secrets. That's the source of his power, that he knows everyone's secrets, too. Um, when I work, certainly I need to know the life story of all of the main characters. And by main characters, I would mean those who have more than a few lines of interaction with the the primary characters, you know, Louisa Barrett in City of Light or Claire Shipley in A Fierce Radiance. I have to know all these things. I mean, do I have to know the secrets of a taxi driver? No. Um, but any person who has more than a passing interaction, and one of the reasons I want to know those things is that, you know, I make an outline when I start a novel. I make a fairly careful outline um, not all fiction writers do. There are many ways of working. But I like to work from a, or I like to have an outline. And then I put it aside and usually don't look at it while I'm actually writing the book. And the reason is that you just don't know what's going to happen when you're writing a book. That's part of the creative process. Things pop into your mind that you could never have foreseen like this thing at the end of City of Light with Mr. Rossi. Um, you have to be open to things like that to happen. And the only way I think you can be open to that is if you really understand the, the details, the secrets of this whole cast of characters that you're juggling in the air simultaneously. Beth, what, what do you think? I, I think I'm going to just say the same thing. I, I, have, I don't work from an outline 
but I know the whole life story of all of the characters of any importance. I know where they were born and when they were when, when and where they were born, where they went to school, brothers and sisters, where they have breakfast. And then when they turn out to have secrets, I'm generally surprised, but I know that the secrets have sprung from character. You know, this leads into something else that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, and many of you may have seen the, the article in the Times on Saturday about changing history to suit a plot. Mm -hmm. And this has been in the news because of Zero Dark Thirty and because of Lincoln, most especially, that. Um, that two uh, people from Connecticut were portrayed as having voted against, um, it was the amendment, I guess, to, to uh, stop slavery. So I know that Tony Kushner, who wrote Lincoln, has waxed on and on about how justified he was in changing history to show this, and I don't buy it for a minute. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm working with a lot of historical figures. I always make the main characters in my books fictional so that I can do things with them that I wouldn't feel comfortable doing with um, real people. But now then, there is the question, of course, Grover Cleveland is a character in my novel, and I put him in an extremely compromised position. But I think I'm justified in doing that because it is something he might have done. Well, he had done it. We he had done it. <laughs> Actually, he'd done worse. He'd done worse. I mean, this woman, Mrs. Halpin, about whom the little ditty was sung, you know, Mama, where's my pa? Going to the White House, ha, ha, ha. Uh, she bore a child. Um, he had her committed to an insane asylum until she would agree to give that child up for adoption to a family of his choice. And I thought, well, someone who would do that, it's not far removed from the fictional scene in which I put him. Um, in A Fierce Radiance, you know, I write about some of the real people who are dealing with the development of antibiotics. I put them in meetings. Um, everything they do is true to what they would have done. And all of the um, uh, corporate shenanigans that happen in A Fierce Radiance, which reflect what I believe actually went mm -hmm. on. But those things are all put into mm -hmm. fictional companies and seen through the eyes of fictional people, because I, I just can't justify putting knowing falsehoods into a book. Um, and you know, Lincoln is being distributed to schools, and Spielberg talks about how proud he is of the study kits that all these innocent children will get portraying history incorrectly. So truth really is truth. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be. Yes. Um, I wonder when you guys were having your three years of discussion, um, what other fictional situations written by other authors you thought about? One thing, just from walking over here tonight, I thought about the innocent betrayal in Ian McEwan's book Atonement, mm -hmm. which became famous, but the perpetrator of the betrayal was didn't know what she was doing, but um, but you know, is there some Dickens with betrayal? Is there some? Oh, there's certainly Henry James. Tons and tons of Henry James. I um, think about atonement a lot. Um, I personally, I think that she knew that she had fingered the wrong man, as it were. That's my opinion. Um, she wasn't innocent, and of course it had catastrophic repercussions. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in Henry James, I often think of the aspirin papers and the man who um, coaxes those two elderly women um, to give up their secrets to him. And you know, even as he is betraying them and taking us into it, his confidence through first-person narration, um, I think the reader feels more and more horror toward him and toward what he's doing. It's an interesting thing in, in gossip because we never feel horror about Gill until the very end. I mean, it's so masterful what you've done. It's only at the end, really, that you realize that Lovey 
is such an unreliable narrator. Um, you go you're with her all through it. Um, whereas in the Aspern papers, you do suspect very early on that the narrator is, is something um, insupportable about what he's doing. I'd say a difference between um, both of our books and uh, some of the famous examples of uh, fiction of betrayal, like Portrait of, of a Lady and Liaison Dangereuse, is um, the idea of betrayal for sport. And I, I myself don't find that to be true to life. It would never have occurred to me that, oh, for instance, to write a character like Gil, who knew he was going to trip her. It, it, it's, I didn't think it was that. I, it, it, in Dexter Rumsey's case either, I think that they both thought they were doing the best they could and that they were good people and that was good enough. Uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think that realist fiction, which we write, fiction that tries to portray a world in a realistic way and show real people struggling with the decisions they make, I, I don't think they betray for sport. It seems, you know, in the weeks we've been talking about this presentation, I, I found myself um, really terribly depressed about thinking about these issues because in a way, this is, a, you know, among the worst things that people do to one another. Yeah. Yes? Um, two questions. Uh, Rose, you know, how old is Lovey? I'm sorry, I can't hear how old, how, how old is Lovey? It wasn't clear to me. Well, she's my age. <laughs> <laughs> she's, um, she's a teenager when we meet her, and at the time she's telling the story, she's in her 60s, and Gil mm -hmm. has died a very old man. But they've had decades, good, good decades. And my other question is, and you're sort of both been talking about this a little bit, about your process, um, about the process of writing these novels, and just wondering about you know, writing every day, a certain number of hours a day, or how you sort of structure your life. <coughs> <laughs> well, in theory, um, I get up every morning <laughs> and uh, read the paper which I need to read more and more nowadays because it gets, as I get older, it gets increasingly hard for me to wake up. Um, and then right after breakfast, I sit down to work and try to work straight through, say, from 9.30 to 2.30, to a late lunch. Um, when I wrote City of Light, my son was very young. And of course, once he woke up in the morning, it was, the household was chaotic. So I actually would get up then at 5.30, at 6 o'clock, and you know, be able to write for a few hours before he woke up. But I can't do that anymore. I'm just too old now. <laughs> so my, my, my answer is the same. When I, was, uh, when I first began writing fiction, my son was young, and he would go off to daycare. And my, so my rule was seven pages or seven hours, whichever comes first. I would work well for five hours while he was at daycare and then two more hours at night if I needed to. But if I covered <coughs> seven pages, I'm so far from being able to do that anymore. The, the brain, the, the spirit's willing, but the rest is not. Um, but our friend, Eleanor Littman, who has managed to produce, what, 11 novels in uh, an, an extraordinarily limited period of time, uh, <laughs> told me that she, she has a strict limit, and uh, which is 500 words, 500 words a day, and sometimes, so, some, so that's my limit now. I, I sometimes, sometimes I do more, sometimes I do much more, but I'm never allowed to do less. <laughs> I'm not sure. And, and if you, if you're starting up after a weekend away or some other interruption of work, or if you're starting up when you've just finished something enormous, like a, like a, cha you know, a chapter or something, you, if you were forced to stop, not in a middle place, but in a stopping place, you're sometimes allowed to do a little fewer than, it takes you longer to get started, so you can do fewer than 500 words. 
<laughs> Perhaps we can have one more question and then we'll sign books. Uh, why Buffalo? Oh, why Buffalo is the question. Um, I grew up in Buffalo, and when I grew up in Buffalo, it was mired in depression, in the economic depression, psychological depression too, probably, in the 70s. And, um, you know, all of my women friends from school left the city. There was no opportunity for us there. And years later, I was back visiting my parents, and I wandered into the Historical Society, which was having an exhibit about the city in 1901. In, uh, the exhibit was in honor of the Pan American Exposition, and I was astonished. We had never been taught going to school in Buffalo that, you know, a hundred years ago, it was one of the great cities of America. And I was just uh, awestruck, really, to learn this story. And I suddenly thought, this would make a great novel. No one would believe it. <laughs> and that's what got me started. <laughs> Lauren has the keys to the city of Buffalo, and I am so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, thank you all very much.